Good evening. Uh, we got our handouts done, but we ain't got none printed off tonight, so we just gonna have you to turn to these places in the Bible. Well, it seems like it's been forever that we've been on fasting. Now I was over Preacher Roy's church this week and I taught a whole series on fasting. And Jenna, tell them who Preacher Roy is. <laughs> so we were there with him all week. We had a good time. The Spirit of the Lord moved and I got to preach a little bit. If you got your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. I'm going to do a little recap. Um, we have been talking about biblical fasting. Biblical fasting. What's the definition of fasting? Anybody remember? Cover your mouth. That's the biblical definition for fasting. Now, any time you're fasting, it has to be partnered with prayer. It's like taking a step. You need what? Two legs to make a step. If you have one leg, you hop it. Okay? So when you're fasting, you're praying. And if you can, it'd be nice to be reading God's Word. Um, so remember that. If you're just fasting, you're just on a diet. Okay? So when you're fasting, you need to be praying. You need to be seeking God. And we talked about the mandated fast and how that they were an absolute fast in the Old Testament with um, the Day of Atonement. And remember, they could have no water, no food, or no physical activity. Now, there's nothing in the New Testament that um, would tell us that we don't need to be working. But if you decide to do a long fast, I would say five plus days, you might need to consider um, taking off if you were to do a fast that long. That's a long time to fast, but it's it's becoming, it's becoming a phenomenon now. Fasting is. Churches are doing 21 days of water. Um, some of them are starting about the first, about midweek of the first week of January or second week in January. I reckon most of them is not missing with the black eyed peas and uh, cornbread and the hog jowls and all that stuff there for January 1st, which is a tradition. Remember what I said earlier, if you can teach your body to say no to food, you can say no to anything. Uh, we talk about fast proclaimed all through the Old Testament. And we got all the way through Daniel. And we closed last time by asking y'all a question. Has temptation for food ever got man in trouble with God? And what did y'all say? Yes. In fact, the first trouble that man was in with God was where at? In the garden. What did he do? Satan swindled her, tricked her with subtlety. And what did she do? She ate the forbidden fruit. Now over there at New Beginning, they said it was an apple. I don't know. But that's what they said. Then they got the talking junk about preacher Roy told his wife said, you don't know what kind of fruit he was. Y'all have to know Preacher Roy, okay? They, they know Preacher Roy. But um, we don't know what kind of fruit he was, but it was what we call forbidden fruit, and she ate it, and man was in trouble. We talked about a, a few more occasions where food has got man in trouble. Well, I closed like this last, last time we were here. I said there are a few more fast mentioned uh, in the Old Testament, but I think we get the gist of this that People called for fast. Individuals fasted. People fasted. Um, remember, remember what we, how we had it laid out. They always had a problem. Well, they proclaimed it. Didn't have a problem. 
They had a problem, proclaimed it, and then they had progress in all of these areas. Every single one of them did. That does not mean, I want you to understand, fasting is not taking God's arm and twisting it behind his back. But fasting is you and I getting ourselves closer to God. He said if we draw nigh to him, what will he do? He'll draw nigh to us. So it's always us getting closer to God. What we say was one of the number one enemies of the church. B-U-S-Y. What's that? Busy. We were busy people. You remember what we said about the early 1700, uh, 1700 or late 1700s, early 1800s when the great revivals and church movements was going on? A lot of folks have studied the great preachers of that time, and just about every single one of them had a fasting regimen. John Wesley, before he ordained a man to preach in the Methodist tradition, asked that man to commit himself to fast till 4 o'clock every Wednesday and 4 o'clock every Friday before he was ordained. Now, our conference will, if we're ordaining, a man in November, we set aside our, that last that last meal we eat that day. Nobody will eat again until we get him ordained. That's nice. I'd like to see it extended a little bit, but we do set aside fasting. And again, that come from the practices of John Wesley. Well, come to find out, John Wesley looked at fasting the same way he looked at prayer. So when John Wesley was praying, a lot of times he was fasting, okay? Fasting just eased away whenever the standard American diet come out, which is sad, right? That's SAD, standard American diet, where they said we had to eat three times a day. Well, man had been living upon earth for years, and he ate when he done walk, gathered food, and after he gathered the food, what had to happen? The food had to be cooked, cleaned, processed, and ate. They did have a way to store food back then. They stored food in the ground. Um, Y'all may have seen some of this. If, if you're kind of up in age, people, people knew how to store food. And maybe they did, but most of the time he was going out gathering and hunting. Uh, they called them hunters and gatherers, and then he brought it in, and the ladies would begin to cook. So, we said this about fasting. It's a tool that makes things possible. Now, again, you're not twisting God's arm behind his back. You're bringing yourself close to God. In fact, one writer said this, when you fast, you choose humility. You see, you don't have to choose humility. No matter what's going on in your life, if you get a report tomorrow that you've got cancer, you still don't have to choose humility. If you're going through one of the greatest trials in your life, you still don't have to choose humility. But when we choose humility, the Bible says when we ump ourselves under the mighty hand of God, what will he do? Exalt us in due time. So fasting is definitely rewarding um, when we begin to do it. So in Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 12, this is where we need to pick up the hope of tonight. As I said last night, um, or like the Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, I was able to get through all of this material. This is on YouTube, and this will always also be, um, it's going to end up on the conference webpage, and also I'll be doing it for the conference. So um, by the time all this is done, I'll I'm probably going to have a belly full of teaching on fasting. But in Isaiah 58, it's the fast that God chooses. Okay? We'll get them handouts to you next week. It's the fast that God chooses. And it's broke down into two categories. Number one, the woes of fasting. And number two, the rewards of fasting. There is a certain conduct and behavior you have to have while you're fasting. It's really a time to be pretty serious. Um, we're going to read some of this, and you're going to find out that these people here in this time here were not serious with their fast. They were doing their fast to do things they shouldn't even been doing, and so God had to rebuke them and tell them, listen, this is the fast I choose for y'all. 
So he said to him in chapter 58 of Isaiah, verse 1, he says, Cry aloud, spur and all, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and they, thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul when thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Now, let's stop right there. What they were doing was they were mistreating their health while they were fasting. They were not, they were not treating the people right. And they overexerted in, in their pleasures and didn't take seriousness as to what they were doing when they were humbling their souls to God. Notice verse 4. It says, Behold, you fast for strife and debate. That is not time to be fussing. It's not. It's time to be feasting. We don't fuss. We feast. What are we feasting on? We're feasting on prayer. And if you have time, feast on your word. Dr. Miles Monroe said, he fasted, I think it was 21 days at work, and said it was a great challenge, especially as he got on towards the end of it. But he said he got an hour off from lunch. Now, he used to, he used to preach, I told you about, was from Jamaica. He ended up getting killed in a tragic airplane crash. But um, he would take his hour lunch and eat nothing but read the Word. And he said while he was reading the Word upon the, the fast, afflicting his soul, he said the word was more imprinted in his spirit while he was fasting. Now, until you hear this man, you're not going to completely understand what I'm talking about because he's one of the wisest preachers I ever heard preach in my whole entire life. The man is simply amazing. And he attributes his ministry and his power behind his ministry to fasting and prayer. And he is, he is amazing with the wisdom God endowed upon him. And so we see here that they're, they're, they're fasting, but they're fasting to strive and debate. Watch this. And to smite with the fist of weakness. So really they're just wasting their time, y'all. They're not in the right conduct, in the right behavior to fast. Can you work in fast? Yes, you can. Or you're going to run up with anybody difficult at work while you're fasting. You might. And just because you're fasting might allow you to be a whole lot nicer to them than you would if you had ate your sauce and egg and cheese sandwich that morning. Amen? Praise the Lord. You can fast at work. Trust me. I wouldn't tell you that if I hadn't done it. You can fast at work. You don't have to tell anybody you're fasting. You know, he, we've been reading that scripture out of Matthew where it tells us to, um, we don't fast before men. We don't wear a sad countenance. We don't do those things. We don't really want anybody to know that we are fasting. Let me say this while I'm talking about it, because there's times you may have to break your fast. Let's say you committed yourself to fast three days, 72 hours. And in the middle of those 72 hours, something happened. Anything that, that you just said, you know, I, I, I got to start fast. God understands that. Okay? He's not going to punish you if you've got to break your fast. I would simply have a prayer. I'd say, Lord, this is coming here. I don't feel like I continue with this, continue with this fast. I'll pick up on another fast later. If you have to break it, you know. Um, and you can't just slip up and eat food now. You can't. Because what? We're so used to eating food. It's just so easy to just eat and say, whoa, I know that my head with all this morning. I'm fasting. And so he said to loose, let me go back up here. Uh, it says to smite with the fist of weakness, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So we see here that they're just fussing. They're, they're fasting, learning for nothing. It's the woe of fasting. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for man to flee his soul? Now remember what I said earlier about where you see the word afflict in the scripture. It most likely meant they were fasting. Where you see the word humble is probably where the people were fasting. Remember that. Um, because there's different words for fast. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him without call this a fast and acceptable day to the Lord? 
Verse 6, it says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? So, despite expressing delight in knowing God's way and approaching him, the people engaging in this fasting were found to be inconsistent with their behavior. They fasted to God. They were not truly living for God. Demonstrating hunger, they demonstrated hatred, unfaithfulness, and unholding their practices while they were trying to fast. So that's the woes of fasting. From verses 5 through 12, we have what we call the rewards of fasting. Dr. Tony Evans said this about this passage. He said, we want the blessing to flow through us, not just to us. You see, so many people love to hoard the blessings of God and house the blessings of God. But we're really meant to be a conduit for the blessings of God to flow through and bless other people. And so, notice what he says here about the fasting God chooses. He says it's to loose the bands of wickedness. Is there wickedness anywhere? Huh? Wow. You can pick up the raw Sonia. <clears throat> wickedness everywhere. You can turn on the TV. Wickedness everywhere. I finally got me a smart TV. My other TV was dumb. It just wouldn't do that. Okay? It, I had a, I don't know how archaic it was. But I like those smart TVs, Prince Charles. Oh, yeah. I can pull up this YouTube video and it looks like I'm on TV, like I'm a movie star. Big face and all, big head. I said, look at that, boy. I like that smart TV, boy. There's a lot to do with it. But he says here, to loose the bands of the wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, burdens that are about to crush people. He says you fast to undo those heavy burdens. Everybody's been through that type of trial in their life where they felt like they were drove to their knees and didn't, couldn't get up, couldn't hardly move, stuck like David in a horrible pit. He says to undo the heavy burdens. I've been so blessed to be able to see people when they're burdened. I can see it. I can tell something's troubling the spirit. You can tell, you know, just like when Nehemiah was before the king, remember? He come before the king with that sad countenance. And I said that he was worrying the burden that he got while he was in sackcloth and ashes. The Bible says he prayed and mourned and fasted certain days because of the condition of the people and the walls being torn down. Now notice what it says here, to let the oppressed go free. To treat people good, y'all. To not bring people up under any kind of bondage or anything like that. Notice what he says there too. He says that, that you break every yoke. I asked this question this week over at New Beginning. I said, why does every yoke have to be broke? Does anybody know? Can I tell you why every yoke has to be broke? When you get saved, every yoke in your life has to be broke. Because when you get saved, you immediately become yoked with Christ. You cannot yoke yourself with anything else, someone else, any kind of sin, anything like that. You have to yoke yourself with Christ. Remember what he said in Matthew 11? He said, come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll do what? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Find me, you love me in heart, you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is like, listen, this is how wonderful our Jesus is. Somebody got saved today. And guess what Jesus has done? He's yoked with them. Somebody's been saved 50 years. Guess what? Jesus is yoking with them. He'll yoke with the infant and he'll, he'll yoke with the uh, mature, adult Christian in their walk with God. Jesus will yoke with every single one of them. That's why in our lives, when we get saved, you have to realize that every single yoke get broke. Because if you put, if you bring, if you try to bring yourself and something else into your relationship with Christ that you're yoked with, it's not going to work. We have to be yoked with Jesus. Why would you want to be yoked with anyone else? Has anybody else made that promise to you? He said, "My yoke is easy, my burden is what light." And, and in all of that, he said, "I'll give you rest." The songwriter said, ain't nobody can do me like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Ain't nobody 
to do me like Jesus. Praise God. And so what we see here is the power of fasting when we buy into it. When we examine the scriptures and we see what God wants to use it for. Also, is it not to deal the bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Now, he does three things after this, y'all. The rewards of this fast is your heart open to the needs of people around you. Fasting will set you free. I want, I want to point out the thens. Notice what it says here. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Your glory will spread. It's God's glory. But because of what you're doing, he said it's, it's the light that God's bringing through you and said it comes forth like the morning. What he's meaning there is you will impact a lot of people. That's what it means there. Because when the sun rises, the sun touches everything. Does it not? It just about touches every single thing when it begins to rise. Notice this, very important, because fasting is good for your health. It says, and thine health shall do what? Spring forth speedily. In, in my handout here, right now in the United States of America and other countries, especially Germany, there are what we call fasting clinics. And people will go to these clinics who have physical problems, mental problems, and spiritual problems, and they will put them on extended fast to cure all these problems. That's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that we've been taught all our lives to eat food to feel better and do better, but we've never been told not to eat food to feel good and to do better. But it's biblical. It's a biblical principle. Remember what he said in Matthew. He said, when you do your alms, I reward you of them. He said, when you do your prayer, I reward you of them. Then he says, when you fast, I reward you of them. If you do all of these in the closet. And he said, when you do it, not if you do it. And then he says, thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. What does that mean? That means this type of fast that he's talking about here is a fast in which God puts his protection around you. He brings those ministering angels around you and he protects you. Then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer, thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, to put him forth of the finger and speak in vanity. Again, he gives a little bit of a rebuke here to what they had did wrong. But if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfied by the afflicted soul, then shall thy light arise in school to thy darkness be as the new as the new day. We see all these benefits. Fasting is a sacrifice for the spiritual advancement of others. In regard to rewards and benefits, the section of scripture is worth looking over to see why you need to fast in your circle of influence. And I want to push this out there. Everybody in here's got a circle of influence. Everybody. Some some people circles blend. That their circle blends with other people. Amen? Everybody has a circle of influence. You have somebody that you're influencing. They're looking up to you. They love you. They honor you. And we have to remember that. And then when they when they when they sense, you know, something going on in your life and something different about you. That you're fasting in secret, eventually God's going to bring an impact upon them. This is by far no exhaustive list in the Old Testament, but this is in tune to the power of fasting. If we choose to use this tool, Jesus said, not if you fast, but when you fast. So let us move to the New Testament to see what Jesus said about fasting. Any questions on that text tonight? Any questions about fasting tonight? Any? Throw them at me. That's a good question over there this week, y'all. One lady asked me, could you eat chewing gum? Chew chewing gum. I said, no. You can't chew chewing gum. Or chewing gum will make you hungry, y'all. Now, I did tell them this. I said, you can eat candy and you can eat chewing gum. As long as don't have no sugar in it, no taste in it. Come on, somebody. I don't want to eat no candy that don't taste. 
And I don't want you no chewing gum that doesn't have no taste to it. And so, the New Testament is full of fasting too, y'all. As much as it is in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament practice, it was practiced by Jesus, John's disciples, the Pharisees, and the early church that is speaking in the book of Acts. Through the Gospels and Acts, we see the power of fasting and deliverance, setting people apart from ministry and seeking direction from God. The term soul fasting, used by the Puritans to describe fasting. The Puritans was another fasting group of people. And when they fasted, they considered it as fattening their soul. Getting their soul closer to God. Getting their soul more fortitude, y'all. Because we're pressed so much in this present world that we're living. Listen, we're in a post-modern society. We're not in a modern society where life was pretty good. When cars were just coming out, when uh, mama, uh, daddy worked, mama stayed home and raised the children. All of these things, that was a modern society. Then we had our pre-modern society. We're in a post-modern society, y'all. We're in a society that's moving fast, y'all. Technology is moving fast. We're in a time where, you know, for us, to, for us to really slow down in our life, we have to disconnect ourselves from Facebook and social media. Um, most of y'all know I've been off of Facebook since the middle of January, but Facebook does everything he can to get me to come back on there. Pretty sure he sends me emails every day. Such and such just posted a picture. Such and such just said this. Such and such just said this. They want me. They want you. There ain't nothing wrong with Facebook. I kind of miss it because of finding out what's going on in the community with churches and stuff like that. But it's been real quiet for me. And by that being shut off, it's allowed me to hear the voice of God a whole lot clearer in my life. And so the Puritans suggest when they say soul factor that it's nourishing and enriching and impactful on the spiritual life. The continue to fasting as practice inside the New Testament church. So turn over to the book of Matthew, if you would, tonight. I'm going to start right there. Matthew 17. One writer said this that prayer connects us to God, fasting disconnects us from the world. Prayer connects us to God, fasting disconnects us from the world. Matthew 17, verses 14 through 21. <clears throat> a text I pray and hope I get to preach from in the very near future. But when they were come to the multitude, Matthew 17, verse 14, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and so vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire, off into the water. Now brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered, said, O oh, faith and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer ye you bring him hither to me? And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because you won't believe, very I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Fasting is a partner to prayer. They'll marry y'all. But the, the church age right now has divorced fasting. They've set away with it. You know, we're all guilty of, of not taking the time to, to fast over certain situations. And fasting is for everybody. It's just not for preachers. It's just not for teachers. It's for everybody to practice. This passage highlights the connection between fasting and prayer. Jesus in response to his disciples' inability to cast out a demon. Now, why couldn't these boys cast out the demon? I'll put it to you with the next text. Somebody take a guess. Why could they not cast out the demon? Somebody tell me. He just said because of their faith. Yep. Anybody else? They had not ever fasted. 
They had never fasted. We'll find that out in this next text when we go into it. Now remember, no matter how you look at the disciples, for three years they were fledglings, they were babies. Imagine a child at three years old and how you got to nourish that child. You have to keep an eye on that child. You can't leave that child by itself. This is similar to the way because Jesus' ministry was so profound he was spoon-feeding them as he went every day and growing them up. And even though he spent three years with them, day in, day out, done this great work, this multitude of work, from village to village and town to town, there still were things that they were not going to put in place and put in practice until Jesus was gone. They were babies. They were babies growing up in the Lord. Jesus was their mentor and Jesus was teaching them how they were to carry themselves and how they were going to deal with this, this stuff when they run into it because they would into the book of Acts. Everybody has a this kind. Everybody. Everybody will have this kind in their life. You want to pray about it, you want to pray about it, you want to pray about it and it's not going to change. And the only way it's going to change it's when you push that plate away and you get serious with God and you draw close to God and then it's going to change. These, these guys have never fasted. I've been telling all this through this session and through this teaching that most scholars say that Jesus rose up at 4 o'clock or maybe even 3 o'clock in the morning to begin to pray. That's a lot of praying, y'all. Amen. There ain't many people going to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and fall on their face and pray. Most times we're going to have to, my people around the house be like texting me. They be te I'm in the bed, they're texting me. When I get up at 4, 4.30, I'm looking at my phone and they're saying, uh, hubby, wake me up at 6.30. Daddy, wake me up at 5.30. Huh? You know what I tell them from time to time, brother, when I just like to be mean. I said, I ain't y'all the wrong clock. I do. Most both of them sit their phone anyway, but I reckon they use me as a backup alarm. That's sad. Man. I'm a backup alarm. I knew I was a trash man, but I'm just real. I just got I just got divine revelation that I'm the backup alarm at the house too. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. I didn't know that. I've always been a trash man. Praise the Lord. And so turn with me to Mark. We'll get Mark done, and we'll be we'll be finished for tonight. Mark two. Very very. Uh, foundational to everything that I just said. Everything that I just said, I'll back up with this right here, this text here. Mark, the second chapter, verses 18 to 22. <clears throat> and the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast or were fast. That could be translated were fast. And they come and say unto him, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? But thy disciples fast not. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they had the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But, in, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, Else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and they rent, and the rent is made worse. And no man put a new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. So what we see here is Jesus told them not to fast while he was here on earth. Don't fast while I'm here. Why? He's got all the power. He's got all the authority. You remember what the Bible said about Christ? The Bible said he had the spirit without measure. And some people, some people take that literally that Jesus Christ housed the whole entire Holy Ghost. You remember? Before he left, he sprinkled a little bit on the boys and they got a taste of it. But now you go to Acts 2, they got all of it, remember? He said, turn ye into Jerusalem until you be what? Endued 
with power from on high. In other words, if the Bible, if somebody says something about they have it without measure, man, wherever Jesus went, the Holy Ghost, he had it at, at, at an oversupply to do anything that needed to be done in, in, in any situation. The Holy Spirit was right there. Jesus responds to this question by why his disciples do not fast. Why would anybody want to fast at a wedding anyway? I want to feast at a wedding, don't y'all? Huh? So you can almost say that, that those three years were kind of spent as that, as that period of familiarity. You know, because the bridegroom selects his groomsmen's pretty early, don't he? Y'all with me on that? Think about that for just a minute. He selects those groomsmen's pretty early. They're a part of the party. Brother Will, you didn't charge no groomsmen for a plate of food, did you? Uh-uh. You didn't charge me neither, brother. It was good, too. Jenna, you didn't charge no groomsmen, did you? It was good, too. Amen? It made sense that while Christ is here, they didn't need to fast. I believe the Lord wanted his disciples to have their full attention on him and how he handled every single situation. He used the knowledge of the wedding feast to indicate that while he was with them, fasting may not be necessary. However, a time for fasting will come when the bridegroom is no longer physically present. Now notice what he says here. He says you cannot put new wine into old skins. You cannot put new wine into old bottles. To my ex-wife. Those skins were used, most scholars agree, one time. And when they took that new wine and put it in those goat skins and the skins that they would use, those skins had to expand and be shaped. You see what I'm saying? And they had to be able to release gas because the wine would have to ferment. And because of the stress that was put on the skins, the new balls, it would only be used one time. Now remember what I said earlier, and I've quoted this a lot here at Hedwell. Life is always a series of beginnings and what? Endings. You don't stay in elementary school all your life. I feel the Holy Ghost, okay? You don't stay in elementary school your whole life, do you? My daughters moved from Up Church, they moved into West Hope Middle School, and then they moved to Hope High, then they crossed the stage, and then they chose their career, and then they'll get married, and then they'll have babies. Is anybody follow me? Life is a series of beginnings and endings, and then eventually, after they have grandbabies, then their mother and father becomes what? Grandparents. Life is a series. And let me tell you something. You need new wine through every, every series, every, every new beginning you go through in life. You need new wine, but you need to be a new ball. Man. Hmm. Life is a series of beginnings and endings. And every, every, every transitional moment, there you are, is always a time of vulnerability. It's always a time of vulnerability. If I had my choice, my children would have stayed in elementary school. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. When they got to middle school, by the time they got in eighth grade, I didn't like obedience school anymore. And by the time they get to the high school, you know, they don't even bother the parents. Oh, they ever heard from any teachers when they got to high school. But that elementary school was just, whew. Bless my soul. Any questions tonight? I gotta shut it down. Any questions? New wine must go in to do new new balls. Okay. There's more to that, a little bit deeper, and I'll get into that hopefully sometime later. So Jesus said to fast. Now, how easy is it to fast? Some of these people over there, New Beginning, had already been fasting as far as their eating window. And I told one guy there, I said, bro, all you need to do is wash your face and don't you go and consecrate that period for a fast. 
If I had never fasted and I wanted to start fasting, I would close my last meal at 6 p.m. in the evening and I wouldn't eat the next day to quit. I believe everybody in this building can do that. And I believe just about everybody walking on the face there that ain't laying in some rest home somewhere can do that. I really believe you can do that. And you know what that does? When you start making itty bitty steps like that, before you know it, you'll be going 24 hours and ain't had no piece of food in your mouth or in your body. Because think about it. If you make it to 12, if you do that for two or three days, it gets easy. It's real easy to go from 12 to 6. And guess what? You've already went 24 hours of humbling yourself to God. And most of us, well, let me, let me just, Robin Hammond, I ain't even going to talk about y'all now. Robin Hammond's normally, his big eating day is Sunday. That's my big eating day. So it's easy for me to do extended fast at the first part of the week. Just keep those in mind. It's just little tokens of wisdom that you can use if you ever begin that lifestyle. God bless you. Thank you. You're good. Thanks, gentlemen.